Great, thank you so much for the kind introduction, Gavin, and uh, we have known each other for 15 years, and you've been a wonderful mentor of mine, so thank you for everything you've taught me over the years, and it's fabulous to be on a stage like this and look out across the audience and know many of you and, and have had many of you influence my career over that time as well, so, so thank you for that. Um, I would like to recognize, of course, and acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of the Clay Lake Tene, uh, and thank you so much for letting us host our meetings and uh, have these discussions on your territories. Um, we are going to run this panel slightly different, perhaps, than the way the rest have been running, so I'm actually going to invite my panelists to stage uh, right away. Um, one of the things, also, I just wanted to note before we get started is uh, the title of this talk is Tomorrow's Leaders. Come on up, guys. Um, and it, colloquially, over the last couple months, we have, as we've been planning, it's been future leaders. And I just want to note that all of these folks really are leaders already in their own right. They've done some fabulous things that they're going to tell us about. Um, and so with that, we really want to make sure that we have a really great conversation with all of you today. So uh, we're going to jump right into things um, and really encourage you all to get onto Pigeonhole. Paper excellence is, of course, the code. Uh, if you haven't downloaded it yet, please do. We really do want your questions uh, and make this a little bit more informal and conversational. So um, with that, we are going to jump right into the panel discussions. Uh, and maybe just from here, uh, we've got Anitra. We've got Cody, we've got Jessica, and we've got Fiona with us today, and they are going to introduce themselves. So, uh, Anitra, why don't you jump in and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your organization. Great. Thanks, Kendra. So, I'm Anitra Paris. I work for Clean Energy BC. We are an industry association that represents clean energy projects, mainly Runner River Hydro, Solar, and Wind. Our memberships comprise of clean energy operators, developers, large part of the supply chain, including a couple academic institutions and a number of First Nations. So if you're familiar with this space, uh, you may have heard of Generate, which is our annual fall conference. and It's been running for 17 years. It's Western Canada's largest clean energy conference in Vancouver. And I get to the pleasure of organizing that. So you should come if you haven't come before. <laughs> and so Clean Energy BC has been representing the clean energy sector for over 25 years. And throughout these many decades, our members have been bringing innovative jobs across BC. And these provide highly skilled, uh, family-supporting jobs in every region of the province. Um, pretty much every project has some sort of First Nations partnership. And what started off as IBAs has now really evolved into First Nations having their own like, ownership and, being, and operating their clean energy projects. Uh, so switching gears here a little bit, if you had the pleasure of attending the lunch yesterday and listening to Premier Horgan, he said that the forestry sector, part of the reason that they are suffering is because of mountain pine beetle and forest fires. And although he didn't use the term, what I heard him say is that they are suffering because of climate change. And that is part of the reason that renewable energy is such an important industry for British Columbia. So the province of BC released the Clean BC Plan, which is our climate action plan. And it was a really holistic view that looks at jobs, the environment, and energy. And in that plan, they listed that we're trying to reduce our emissions by 40% um, below 2007 levels by 2030. And so in order to reach those, we really need to focus on electrifying our system. So as you guys work in natural resources, I'm sure you're aware we have a low carbon electricity grid. But that only provides about one third of our, our energy system is based on the electricity. The other two thirds is still on fossil fuels. So that's mainly through transportation, the way we heat our buildings, and also the way we drive our industrial processes. So in order to really bolster this energy transition, we need to focus on decarbonizing it and focus on electricity as a backbone to meet those targets. Uh, so I studied natural resource conservation and sustainable energy policy. And I was really encouraged when I saw the abacus data that was collected for this conference. It said that 95% of respondents wanted to see renewable energy be, a more important or the, be more important or the same in the next 10 years as an industry for BC. So that means 80% of respondents want to see it be an even more important industry than it already is. And, you know, re natural resources, it's not, it doesn't operate in silos. It's all connected. And I think that that is part of the reason that people are so supportive of renewal en renewable energy, <laughs> is that it's not only its own industry, but it's also supporting other industries in meeting their goals and their emission reduction targets and keeping competitive on the global scale. So 
thank you guys for having me here. I was actually I'm based in Vancouver right now where Cleaner GBC is, but I was actually born in Prince George when we were living in Mackenzie, so it's pretty awesome to be here, and thank you to the organizers. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Welcome home. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Great, Cody, go ahead and tell us about yourself. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Cody Penner. I currently live in Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm a uh, member of the Teltan Nation, and I currently work for the Teltan Central Government. Um, I've been there since about last March. Prior to that, I was an underground miner at Bruce Jack Mine, pre is Bruce Jack Mine. So um, to give a little background story, my dad's been a miner his whole life, my brother was, so. It's been a major part of my life growing up. You know, I put food on the table and I, I got to learn all sides of it. Um, obviously working underground to working more on this side. So my current role is I'm the employment director with the Teltan Central Government. And uh, for those of you that don't know much about the Teltan Nation or, or what we do, our uh, traditional territory encompasses 11% of British Columbia. It's in the northwest corner. Um, it goes into, into Alaska a little bit. and. Uh, and mining plays a massive role in the economy there. So it's, it is the main supplier of jobs and money that flows into inv individual homes. And, uh, and it, you know, as I worked on both sides of the industry, I just kind of realized the breadth that it has. You know, you can really use mining to, uh, as a vehicle to like live out your passions in whatever you may want to do for work. So as the employment director, I'm trying to educate, you know, Teltan specifically, but you know, everybody on the opportunities that it does provide and, uh, and try to break down old misconceptions. You know, it's, uh, it's a very progressive industry that uh, is on the forefront of, of co-managing the land and, and, you know, protecting the land and, and working with, you know, indigenous people and local communities. And um, Teltan, you know, is on the forefront of, of getting the agreements and, and, you know, fulfilling them as well, right? It's, it's, it's easier said than done to get the, get the agreements done, but you know, my job is to try to provide 30% Teltan employment on sites, and that's, that's, a, that's a tough racket. I mean, 80% of Teltans actually live outside of the territory, right? Only 20% live inside, and we have about 4,000 members, so I mean, you look at the amount of activity that's happening, and you want 30%, or for, that's just a baseline example. Um, on a site, it's, uh, it's easier said than done. <laughs> so my current job is to educate people on the breadth, like I said, of the industry, if they're in, into the environment, if they actually want to go underground and blow up some rock and, and pull it out, um, maybe they want to get in the HR side or accounting, whatever it may be, you can, uh, you can find that through mining and mineral exploration. And uh, you know, it's our, our goal and my mission to, to let Teltans that are living outside territory know that and hopefully get them back into territory or wherever they want to live and work and, uh, and get involved in the opportunities that our leadership has been working so hard for so many years to accomplish and get, right? They've been working for, you know, years and years to be able to provide the opportunities for advancement and growth. And, uh, and I'm just happy I get to come in at a time where all that's been semi-established and, uh, and now it's our job to, to get to fill those positions. It's kind of, it's a good position to be in, right? Be able to you know, have a bit of a surplus and now you need to find a way to actually get it fulfilled. So it's, uh, it's exciting times and, and I'm looking forward to the future. Okay. Thanks, cool. well, thank you so much for having me on this panel and to Kendra for getting us all organized. Um, I'm Jessica. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Hydra Energy, where I'm responsible for business development, finance, and operations. Hydra is based in Delta. We're a clean technology company and we're really excited next quarter to start building our first commercial project here in Prince George. It's nearly a $30 million project with over 20 jobs that will be created, and it reduces greenhouse gas emissions. We capture waste hydrogen from a local chemical plant, and we deliver it to fleets or for use in natural gas pipelines. For the fleets, we install a kit that lets a heavy-duty truck currently running on diesel co-combust with hydrogen. It's a really simple injector, some piping that goes through the back into hydrogen tanks that are located behind the cab. We can displace up to 40% of their diesel with green hydrogen. That corresponds to almost a 40% drop in greenhouse gas emissions because the hydrogen is clean. 
it's a really difficult sector, heavy duty trucking, to get emission reductions in. So this enables uh, us to cost effectively address climate change. We completed a testing program here in Prince George with a local fleet for the last three years where we showed getting equal performance to what they were getting with diesel trucks. I'm talking same torque, same efficiency, same power. Um, also, really satisfied drivers. The drivers that have driven our trucks have come with us to talk to other fleets and explain the benefits of using these trucks. Um, fleets don't have to buy anything new. There's nothing expensive about it. There are no modifications to the engine block that we're doing, so it doesn't violate base warranties. So if you've worked with fleets, you know violating a warranty is a huge deal for them. So being able to work with dealers has been an important part of our progress. In fact, Hydra pays for all the equipment that I was mentioning. We do the installations, and in exchange, we have a, a long-term contract that we sign with the fleets for the hydrogen supply. That hydrogen is supplied at a 5% discount to what the fleets pay for diesel. So we're, for the first time, we're supplying hydrogen for a lower cost than diesel. Uh, our hydrogen can also be injected into a natural gas pipeline, helping utilities and oil and gas companies meet renewable content requirements. Uh, so thank you again for including us in the panel. It's really a pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to spending more time here. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. It's uh, my turn. Thank you, Kendra, for having us here. Thank you, C3, for inviting us. It's, it's, uh, it really gives me a lot of hope that we even have this platform. And I know it can be a little scary asking youth to get up on stage because you don't <laughs> know what's going to happen. But, um, and thank you all for coming and being here and attending our session. I'm not, I'm not nervous. It's fine. We're all going to get through this together. <laughs> we'll just keep rolling. My introduction is a little bit different than my co-panelists because apparently I am bad at following instructions. Uh, <laughs> so I'll just go into it. But a bit about me. Um, I've been in the forest sector essentially my whole career. Uh, and I didn't grow up uh, knowing about forestry at all. And now I have the pleasure of working for the BC Council of Forest Industries where I'm a project manager. I do communications and marketing and work with our policy team. Because I'm in communications, I always assumed that I would be in advertising or work at a marketing agency. But I fell into forestry, and I've stuck around in it because I love it. I'm in it. I have the fortunate position to know all of the great things about it, even during challenging times. And so I feel it's my responsibility to share that passion with others because I believe that anyone from any background can find a fulfilling career and have a fulfilling lifestyle in the forest sector. Saying that out loud, it sounds like maybe I have Stockholm Syndrome a little bit because <laughs> forestry is all I know, but it's true and I'm very passionate. So I'm looking forward to our discussion today and I just wanted to touch on two key things um, that I hope can um, influence and give a little bit of flavor as we're talking about the future. And those are recruitment and retainment, which are equally important. Recruitment is the obvious one. Everyone in this room knows it can be a challenge for the natural resources sector, and that's why we've been asked to be here today. How do we attract the next generation workforce? What does the future look like? We have good stories to tell, as I said, even during the challenging times. For forestry, as we're working through our current climate we're in, we know that when we come out of this, the forest sector will be a little bit different it will possibly be a little bit smaller or right-sized. In other areas, it might grow. But for, this, uh, for that, it means the headline for the general public can be a bit scary, and they may assume that that means less opportunity and less jobs. But it's actually the opposite. The stat that we have to pay attention to in forestry, and it's so key, it's just straight demographics, is that over the next 10 years, about 50% of our workforce will be ready to retire, which means that there is still bound to Bountiful. See, it's just, it's just nerves, guys. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> um, there's still bountiful, good-paying, fulfilling opportunities in the forest sector. And the second part, briefly, is retention. And it's so, so equally important. And I feel often um, we're so focused on recruitment, and then we get the young superstars into our businesses, into our sector, and then we don't do the work to retain them. For the first time in history, we have four generations working alongside each other, and in some cases, even five. 
Generation Z is entering the workforce now. They're about 23 years old and younger, and their retirement age is constantly on the rise. This creates workplace dynamics that can be a little challenging at times. <laughs> Youth today, and I can get up on my soapbox any time about this, so if you want to come talk to me after, we can have a debate over a beer sometime. But youth today are not okay with being told if it ain't broke, don't fix it. The rhetoric of paying your dues and working to retirement to be happy, uh, that rhetoric is shifting and we want the story to change. What we're wondering, what we're saying is why can't we all work together so that we can have happiness and fulfillment over the course of our lives, over the course of our careers. And when I say happiness and fulfillment, <laughs> thank you. I'm not talking about like youth don't want beanbag chairs. I'm working on an office puppy, I do want that, but like, <laughs> you know, those are surface level things. What we want is fair pay for fair work, respect, and opportunity to grow and learn. We want to learn, we're thirsty to learn. So with all that said, I'm so excited for our panel today. It's great to be up here with this, these guys, so thank you. <laughs> Well said, Fiona, thank you. And so a number of uh, themes, I think, have emerged. And, and when we think of leaders of tomorrow uh, and leaders today, um, but what that future looks like. So a few key themes that I, I want to touch on, and, and I think we look a little bit backwards to sort of see how, you're, how things have changed during, during your careers, but looking forward as well. So what do we think the future holds? Uh, and a lot of those uh, conversations these days tend to revolve around technology and innovation. Uh, they tend to revolve around uh, climate change. And I think technology and climate change quite often go hand in hand. Uh, I also want to touch a little bit uh, on some of the protests, the climate change protests uh, that have been happening and, and people's opinions on that. So uh, let's maybe start uh, looking backwards a little bit and um, Talk maybe a little bit, we'll start with Anitra again. Talk maybe a little bit about uh, how you've seen things change and we'll try to get everybody in and, and have a, a quick conversation. So how do, you, how do you think things have changed really since your first day on the job? My first day on the job wasn't very long ago, but there still has been some change. <laughs> uh, I would say mainly it's really been just like the amazing things that have been happening with renewable energy technologies. The prices have been coming down just in, it, to an insane amount. It's like wind is now the most cost competitive way to create energy. And you know, that's something that we all need to think about. It's not just this little windmill that's going around. It's a, it's a, these are wind turbines. It is a really mature industry and the price is there. It's now cost competitive. Um, I would say, you know, the biggest <clears throat> barriers really come from more like regulation and kind of around that side of thing. But in terms of the cost, the price is there. Um, and so not, we don't have that in British Columbia as much, but the cost of batteries as well is, is a huge thing to be watching. Um, you know, with hydro, we actually have a really great opportunity with dams, the way that those work, they kind of act as a battery. But moving forward, I, I do think we need to watch battery technologies too. Yeah, okay. Great, Cody, how have things changed for you? Once again, yeah, it wasn't that long ago I got into it, so uh, how have things changed? Well. Obviously, I'm sure you guys have been hearing the whole conference. Uh, things are getting a lot more technology, te technologically advanced, I suppose. And uh, as that changes, we're going to have to kind of shift our workforce into the future with new skills, be able to adapt to it. Um, the main one that I have, obviously, in our mind in Teltan territory, we recently had Newcrest come into Red Chris. And, um, there may be a, well, there's a possibility of block caving in the future, so that's gonna bring a whole new workforce. Teltans are skilled miners. We've been doing it for a long time. Um, we have some traditionally uh, different, I suppose, skills, like we got a lot of operators, fantastic operators. We do have a lot of educated people, but we're gonna have to focus on shifting our, our um, skills to a more, I suppose, advanced, so we're gonna need more technicians and, and um, you know, mechanics and things like that to kind of proceed with, with the change in environment with mostly the mining sector, mineral exploration as well. Um, Have you seen much change in technology since you started or is that, do you see that as a need of where we're going? It's only been a few years, not too much, but <laughs> it's more of where we're going, I suppose, in the territory. Obviously, there's other examples in the world um, where they are doing that stuff, but within the territory, there has been some, but I feel like in the next few years, it's definitely mm -hmm. the gap that we're gonna have to fill. Yeah, okay. 
Great, Jessica? Sure. Um, I initially started working in the BC government on clean energy and climate policy and made the shift to the private sector just over five years ago. And I guess there's like three key things that come to mind that I, I really see as differences from when I first started my career. The first one is, I think, a trend uh, for green with consumers. Um, people wanting, like you mentioned, with jobs, people looking at what they're passionate about, what's green, and it's the same in purchase decisions. And I think uh, you know, people complain about the plastic straw thing, and I think that's just the tip of the iceberg, though. And from it shows people that there um, that there can be a change in products. So sure, maybe today it's a plastic straw, but it's going a lot deeper, I think, uh, in the future. The second one is. That green shift has also been happening with investors, which I'm sure has affected lots of people in this room. I was in London for the last three years working at a fund, and you know it's, it's very much top of mind that you know, European Investment Bank, for example, no longer issuing loans as of 2021 to oil, gas, or coal mining. And I guess the last thing that I noticed is, um, earlier this week I was at the Clean Tech Forum in San Francisco, so the biggest conference for clean technologies in the world. And there's way more women there. And even we were, I was mentioning before I got on this stage, like, this is the first panel I've been on where it's more women than men. Sorry, Cody. Um, <laughs> men have great perspectives as well, but it's really nice to see that balancing out more, that gender parity. Um, it's really been moving along since I started my career. And there's been a lot of work done on that front from in just increasing the numbers of, of not only women, but skilled immigrants as well yeah. in, in the natural yeah, resources sector. So it's a diversity it's nice of different working. voices that are, are, are coming to the fore, for mm -hmm. sure. Great. Yeah. Great, thanks. Um, I guess for me, climate change is obviously a huge one, and, and while throughout my whole life it has been a narrative for me, and, um, and I'm sure everyone else, but uh, over the past 10 years, that's obviously escalating quite quickly, uh, and so the exciting thing about working in forestry is that we are a climate change solution. Forest products mitigate carbon. Uh, we are renewable. We are green. Um, so I think that's, it's a huge opportunity for us. Um, you know, and it, it, it does get quite depressing opening Twitter every day and seeing the news, but um, I think that's a good story that we have to tell and, and, and bringing youth into our sector, um, that they can be part of the climate change solution. Uh, another big change that I've seen, and I'm just, it's so refreshing, is I think that natural resources sector as well, and then specifically forestry, we're quite open to trying to adapt and keep up with the time. So the adoption of social media and trying to get our messaging out there in different ways, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's really nice. I know that it's difficult, like all of our sectors are, have a very long history and it can be difficult to change, um, but it's so important, especially if you're trying to get in touch with youth today to, uh, to tell them your story. You need to be able to keep up with how they're receiving news. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good point, and, and I like that you bring up Twitter, and that yeah, that's actually a source of, of news flow for you, and, and you, you find out what's going on and, and stay up to date. And just before we came up on stage, we're having a conversation about TikTok, so perfect audience <laughs> question, participation. How many of you have heard of TikTok and know what it is? We've got a couple. Oh, there actually, you go. That's, awesome. that's pretty good. I'm impressed. So um, I think that's a, a really interesting conversation as well, and, and social media changes yeah, and, and it's, not, it's not going to go away, and it's going to continue to adapt, um, and, and it will keep growing. And so I know parents often are quite uh, wary of their children being on social media, as they should be, but they're going to get on it no matter what. I know that you think there are apps there that, like, limit their access, but kids are sm smart. Remember, you guys were sneaking out at some point, I'm sure, right? Same thing. Um, but, like, at TikTok, for example, people think it's just stupid videos, and the example I use all the time is I follow a marine biologist. Mm -hmm. I follow a guy that runs an apiary. I know so much about bees now. I, never, I didn't even know I had room in my head for that. How to grow vegetables. Um, there are many organizations and other sectors outside of natural resources that are starting to use those mediums to get messages across. Yep. And I think probably one of the challenges many of us have, and, and I include myself in that, is staying current with social media and what the best platform is to use for communicating different types of messages. So. Um, that sounds like a whole other workshop for another day. But, um, so I want to talk maybe a little bit about how you all got here today. And there is a question here on Pigeonhole that uh, does have quite a number of votes on it. And it's all about uh, our mentors that we've had over the years and uh, what they've done to bridge the, the generational gap and really engage you in the chosen sector of, of resource sector that you have chosen to work in. So um, 
I'll throw it open to whoever wants to answer that, but tell us a little bit about the role your mentors have played. Okay, I'll go first. Um, mentors have been a huge, two of them are in the room today, and I'm so excited that they're here to support me. Um, but it's, it's such a huge, and it's not just mentorship, it goes past that, it needs to be championship. If you have youth in your organizations, it doesn't take a lot of time um, just to reach out and listen and um, n uh, let them know that they've been heard. We don't know what we don't know. And we might come into your office or to your operation and say we have a great new innovative idea and you'll be like, oh, I remember back in 1996 we tried that and it failed. <laughs> we don't know what happened in 1996, right? But it's that, like, it's that opportunity and feeling comfortable that you could go in and put something forward. And we know sometimes it might be not the best idea or we might get pushback or just a straight no. But that openness and to feel comfortable, is, it's so important. So find your youth, mentor them, be open with them. Maybe you can just touch it because you brought it up, the difference in your mind between a mentor and a champion. Uh, mentorship can be quite uh, passive, right? It's easy to have, um, to say, I'm your mentor, watch me, this is how I do it. But it's, the difference is a champion will say, hey, this, I'm up here today because people have championed me and said, we have an opportunity for you, and we really want to push you, and we'll support you to get there and get up there. But that's, that's the championship versus a passive mentor. Just watch me and learn. Mm. And I think the other key for me is the champions will go to bat for you without you knowing about it. Yes, that's also a key thing. Yeah, yeah. sponsors. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Any other comments? Uh, well, one of my the original mentors that everybody has is your parents. So my dad is here in the audience, and I got exposure to the independent power producer sector through him. You know, we would go and I grew up getting to see what a hydro plant looked like and you know, even that exposure to industry is it's huge to know that it's possible. And then but in my professional career, um, we've actually been going through some leadership changes at my organization. So the person who would be the obvious mentor has it's kind of been changing all the time. So I'm actually really huge on formal mentorship programs too. You know, if it doesn't fall in your lap, you kind of have to go and seek it out. Uh, there's a, in Vancouver, there's a Women for Climate program that I took part of. Uh, I've been involved in climate guides, and I actually helped organize a mentorship program for women in backcountry sports. So I really think that mentorship is, it's kind of been the word of the decade for me. Like, I think that it will continue to be, continue to be that, but... Yeah, you need, you need to see those examples. You can see kind of what is possible and why you might want to go and seek it out. So you've actually benefited from being a mentor and being a mentee in those yeah. programs. Yeah, mentor, mentee, organizer. So just seeing how other people have been benefiting from it because not everybody's going to get the same value and it's going to bring different, different traits for different people. And you've probably benefited whether you were the mentee or the mentor. For sure. It's definitely a two-way street. I don't think that it's just one directional. Okay. Yeah, mentorship's massive, obviously. Like you said, the first ones are your parents. I, my dad was, like I said, a miner. He's managed some operations, so you kind of get thinking like that, and that's mm -hmm. how you kind of grow up and you get your base skills. But, uh, like, without it, you're kind of starting from ground zero. I mean, you get your leaps and bounds if you can learn what people have worked their whole lives to learn, and then you can gather that knowledge and take off from where they are. Like, it's, you're just leaps and bounds ahead. So, I mean, it's crucial, and... Um, I work with this one group in Vancouver at a school, and it's a bunch of, a bunch of kids that grew up in East Van, and they're at-risk youth. And, uh, you know, we get there as mentors, and, you know, we're just people mm -hmm. that come there and mentor them, and, and it helps them get through the tough times. Like, obviously, there's some good stories that come in where they were, you know, got mixed up in the wrong things. But those kids come up to us after and, like, thank you so much for the mentorship, just being here, mm -hmm. just your presence and seeing that, you know, you're normal people, you're progressing through life or doing well. And... Uh, and it helps keep them out of trouble and, and certain things on that level. So just from the ground up, having good mentors is, uh, is so crucial to staying on a clear path. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's also really important to have mentors because they help understand the past. So why didn't that thing in 1996 work? Um, you don't know that until you have the ability to have an open conversation with your mentors and really understand the dynamic, not just, no, it didn't work, but being open to that conversation of what were all the factors that made it not doable? Is it something that we should reopen and look at again? Um, to your point, Kendra, there's a, a back and forth 
between a mentor and a mentee where the mentor is also learning too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really valuable thing for organizations to be able to be progressive companies is kind of embracing new ideas too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So there is another question on here that seems quite popular and Cody, I'm maybe gonna direct it at, at you first because of your role as employment director, but uh, the question is that we all happen to be based in the lower mainland and so how do we really encourage uh, youth and the next generation to uh, be employed in the north? And of course we, we are in Prince George, we're only halfway north in the province and you know, lower mainland this is like far north in most yeah. people's mm -hmm. minds in, in uh, urban Vancouver. So. Um, how do we get that concept across of there is still half a province north of us and that it is a, a fantastic place to go and work? Yeah, that's a good question. It's more than the price <laughs> of a house yeah, in that's a, Isn't that the question? <laughs> um, yeah, no, that's a great one. It, uh, you know, the jobs up there, you gotta, you gotta appeal to people's values in a different sense than, than, say, strictly money. You know what I mean? Like when you're, when you're trying to kind of promote jobs and you're living in Vancouver and like, like you go talk to someone in Vancouver, be like, oh, like why don't you go work up north with good money? They're like, oh, I don't want to, it's cold and you got to go to camp and do all these things. So you got to kind of appeal to people's values on the other end too. I mean, when you go to, go to a big operation, you, you, you have a sense of belonging, right? I mean, if you don't, just for example, if I was a miner, right? So if you don't pull out that load of muck from the ground, you're not bringing gold to the crusher, and you're not, the operation doesn't, doesn't work, so you have a sense of belonging, you're part of a team, mm -hmm. right? Everybody's looking for things like that, and um, obviously financially it does help. I mean, we, we need to educate people on how that can accelerate um, your savings and provide you with time, right? Time is a cornerstone, one of the parts of happiness after all, is we, we would all love to do what we, you know, only what we'd like to do, so, you know, these jobs, if used properly, um, can you help provide you with that time? And, uh, and also, like I worked at Bruce Jack and they have a fantastic camp, a good rec center, uh, extracurricular activities that you can do so you don't feel like you're just going once again to a cold camp up north and sac completely sacrificing just strictly for the money. Um, so you gotta appeal to these other things that, uh, that are reality. Companies work really hard to make them a reality. And, um, I think that the key message there really is passion and, and Fiona touched on it earlier as well and um, maybe just by way of example just because we're talking about Bruce Jack I spent a, a good part of my career working uh, just outside just west of uh, Prince George and uh, quite a bit of time in the far north as well in the Yukon and uh, really it was that camaraderie within yeah. the camp and I was in very small exploration camps but it's that same um, sort of family atmosphere that you build quite quickly when you're in a situation like that far away in a, in a, for me, a remote camp, you know, helicopter access, and, and all of a sudden you, you build this team of people who become your, you know, estranged sort of aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters that, you know, unrelated, but you, you end up with bonds that are quite like that, so. Definitely. You, uh, it's also about breaking down old misconceptions about the industry and how we're moving forward with it and how it's so progressive and how we, you know, co-manage the land and we're close, close with the local communities Sometimes you speak with people that haven't actually seen it or aren't educated on it, and they're like, oh, well, I don't wanna, I don't wanna be involved because I'm you know, mm -hmm. putting into the problem what they think is the problem, right, with, that we're having, but it's a very progressive industry, and you know, we do the best we can as, as humans to protect the environment and, uh, and co-manage and, and communicate with the locals, and uh, that's something that, that you gotta educate people on as well to, to get them feeling like they're, they're helping the thing, because it's yeah. happened, happening either way, right, so. And that there is a role for everybody in this yeah, industry, and yeah. somebody touched on it earlier, where there's, you know, there really is a, a spot for whatever your passion is, whether it's communications, yeah. or mm -hmm. uh, the regulatory side of things, the social side yeah. of things, so. Um, Maybe it's also about moving some of those jobs out to site and, and further north to some of the mm -hmm. other communities. So, yep. other comments? Cody and I were talking about this a little bit yesterday. It was, you know, it's also, things are changing with, in terms of, you know, we're talking about a, a fiber optic cable, right? You're wanting to bring, you need that type of infrastructure to bring people to those areas. And mm -hmm. uh, it, this is very much more south, but uh, we have a member, Mary, uh, Mary Austin of Austin Engineering, and they advocate for rural development in a, in a really big way in the Kootenays. And the model that they have set up there is kind of this incubator where you can cluster together different organizations. And 
what's really cool about that is it's, you know, there's high technology, there's internet of things, data centers, that doesn't have to be in the city. In fact, it's actually probably better if it's not in the city. Um, data centers do better in cold, cold weather, so there's that advantage too. Um, so I think it's kind of rethinking, you know, besides the traditional industries, how can we incorporate the other ones that maybe youth are excited about, but then also realizing that those highly innovative technologies actually will just improve the natural resource sector as well. So, you know, it's kind of this symbiotic relationship, and if you were to bring these rural tech hubs, and it, but it, it's very intentional, like you have to come in with a plan and a strategy, it's not just gonna happen. So that's, that's part of my thoughts around that too. Okay, so um, just because we're on the topic, I think we'll go to, to this one as well. Any advice for employers with uh, uh, multiple generations regarding keeping everyone engaged and inspired? I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in any great organization, like you would never, um, if you run an organization and you're part of it, you would never group people by age within your selective. Like we wouldn't go in this room and be like, boys over here, girls over here. Boomers over here, Gen X over here, right? Like, I think we're so stuck in labeling people. We see this obviously in a much more egregious cases as well, besides age, but we're so stuck in labeling people and thinking that they're so different from us because they're in a generation that we miss the point that we're all just people and we all have our values and morals that we need met. So keeping everyone engaged and inspired, it has to be on an individual basis, honestly. And I know that's difficult because some organizations are just so large. But it's about talking to your employees and what are their values, you know? Um, uh, whatever you have, uh, I just, I, I think of like benefits plans or um, perks or vacation time. Um, some people more, want more flexibility, others don't. It's just, it's about having those open lines of communications uh, within your organization to figure out what fits and what you're also able to do. You can be honest as an organization, maybe flexible time doesn't work here, maybe it does, um, but we really need to get we're all the same. We've all gone through challenges, no matter what decade that we grew up in. We're all the same at the end of the day, and so we just need to get past those barriers of thinking we're all different. Mm -hmm. there, we ha I was, there was a panel earlier this week that I was watching, and it was, uh, it was on young versus old generations. Uh, they asked a really good question on well, what if, what generation do you actually identify with? Like, forget how old you are. Mm -hmm. And they all picked a different one. <laughs> so I think there's a lot of understanding across the generations, and it matters less about how old you are, but how able you are to empathize mm -hmm. with other people. And like, for example, in our company, we have anyone from you know, young 20 to somebody that's 70, and what keeps us all together is a sense of purpose. Having a really clear purpose for your organization of why am I here, why am I showing up every day, I think is more important than how old you are. Mm -hmm. yep. So I want to talk a little bit about climate change. Uh, obviously the last probably year or so that's been heavily in the news with a lot of protests and um, certainly in, in Vancouver we see Extinction Rebellion Quite often we see sustainability teens, and uh, I'm just wondering, and, and there's a number of questions in, in Pigeonhole that sort of are relating to um, emissions and climate change, so, so we'll get to that. But I want to know your thoughts and your comments on uh, what's happening in, the, in that movement, um, sort of what the, the youth that are really part of that movement are thinking, and, and really how it impacts this industry in terms of our future recruitment and how we're going to get those folks that are, you know, eight or 10 years old now interested in natural resources and, and wanting to pursue a career and, and join us? I definitely have an opinion on this. <laughs> uh, you I know, somebody whenever, <laughs> whenever I, people ask me this question, I kind of like to flip it back to them. And it's, well, what about the cost of if we don't do enough? Because really that cost is just so much bigger. I mean, I can't even begin to imagine if we had fires the scale that they had in Australia. Like, the country is pretty much becoming uninhabitable. Uh, I mean, we're not at that scale for fires yet, but, you know, it, it, it does impact you, and it does definitely, Im it impacts in so many ways that are, are linked, and people don't often make the connection. Um, you know, even, for instance, with the forest fires that were happening in BC, a lot of people, including myself, like, I had asthma growing up as a kid, and when the forest fires were happening, I had to stay inside. And I'm a very active person. Usually I like to hike, I like to mountain bike, I like to do all these activities. 
I couldn't do any of that. And it actually had a really big impact on my mental health, personally. So, I mean, that's just me, that's one person, but you think about how that's having an imp impact on our society overall, right? You're gonna choose to not go to certain parts of the province because of the fires. And it's just gonna have this whole impact on our society. And I, I don't wanna say that trying to avoid that is priceless, but you know, I would invest a lot of money in having a better future, personally. Um, I think a, another key thing um, that we're seeing really youth mobilize around, but everybody needs to, is, is this idea of, um, we've been told for so many years that the way to solve climate change is in our own homes. Mm -hmm. So not using plastic straws and making sure you put your compo compost out every week. But what we're really realizing, and I think youth are mobilizing around this, is that it's, it's kind of BS. Like not one person can solve it. Mm -hmm. It's large industries that need to make fundamental changes to their businesses if we're really going to move the dial. And I think that's what the natural resource sector has a huge opportunity to do, to be the first sector, to be the leaders and say, we are willing to make the changes and we're going to do it. We know it's our responsibility. And I think many of us in this room are already doing that. Mm -hmm. And that's why there's so much opportunity for youth to get involved in the sector because we can make the change. Yeah. And that's how you attract youth to want to work with you, right? Like all of my friends, that's how they're choosing which jobs they're taking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there's definitely a big shift, I think, in employment with millennials looking for jobs with purpose. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'm in the clean tech industry. Our biggest customers, our biggest funders are natural resources. So it's not, I feel like it's not a black and white thing. Mm -hmm. You can't have your lithium battery in your laptop and your phone and your and in your electric vehicle without mining for example so the the two need to go hand in hand and work together mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah it needs to be something where we're coming up with ways to more sustainably and ethically source mining, not protest mining. So I think there's a lot of um, room for conversation that needs to happen um, between the protesters and actually getting to solutions. Like my fear is that it's just really polarizing. Mm -hmm. well, and I think the natural resources sector is, is changing and evolving as well, and, and these conversations are very much commonplace. And so there's an incredible opportunity to look at those youth and say, okay, great, if this is really what you're passionate about, then come and join us and, and help improve those parts of our industry because we can always improve. Mm -hmm. there's, there's never an end to that process. So. Um, so we've got a question here about uh, reducing emissions and the cost associated with that. So it is a really easy thing to say that we all want to reduce emissions, but of course there is a, a rather large cost to that. So uh, maybe the two <laughs> tech people on the stage uh, can talk to that and, and the cost associated with it. It's just not more expensive anymore in a lot of cases. <laughs> so yeah. it's yeah. like our solution is cheaper than diesel. There's other... Uh, you, know, I mean, you can expand on more in the energy sector and for electricity. These are now the cheaper solutions. So there are a lot of options out there definitely that are under R&D and you know, they can be supported by other mechanisms, um, government grants and things like that. But in the, in the private sector where we totally understand decisions need to be financially based as well as um, thinking about social and environmental outcomes, but there are solutions today that can accomplish those things. Nitra, want to comment? No, I, I completely <laughs> agree. It's now the most economic choice. So I saw a funny panel one time that was talking about some conservative people in, in the States, and it was like, even the conservatives love wind. And it was like, okay, let's not make this a political thing. But I thought it was kind of funny, because it's, it's true. It's now economically the most viable option. Yeah, and I, I, like I look at our company and I think it's, it's just kind of a win-win solution. We're paying a chemical company for something that they were previously venting, just mm -hmm. wasting. Um, we're offering fleets, something that's lower priced than diesel, and we're making a profit. And the environment, there's 40% less emissions. So it's, there's solutions, as I said, that just kind of can meet all the criteria. It doesn't have to be one wins and the other loses. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's look to the future. We look out, let's say, 2040 and we have an amazing resource sector that's thriving and bringing in huge amounts of investment dollars. How is it that we got there? If we fast forward, if we, sorry, come backwards back to today and I told you that that's what the future looks like, how would you say we got there? Hmm. What did we do? We 
Or in other words, what needs to be done today <laughs> to get us to the vision that we have? And I think it's uh, that we can't slow down. The, the, what's happening today, to be successful in 2040, um, we can't slow down the momentum because 2040 isn't that far away. And we know what barriers we're facing now. Um, and the only, like, we can't, we just, we can't slow down. If you have an idea for innovation, if you have an idea for climate change, it can't, it can't be a 20-year strategy. It has to be done now. Action needs to be taken. Um, I, like, and, like, well, I'm here to plug forestry, but I, I'm, I'm quite optimistic because I see that happening in forestry. We have great innovation centers. Uh, we have great um, think tanks uh, to get us forward. But it is, it's, you can't slow down. So you need the funding, you need the enthusiasm, uh, you need people who are willing to understand that making the difficult, maybe more expensive choices today need to happen to make it into the future. As far as the, uh, the communities that, that we deal with up in, up in Teltan territory, I think it's about trying to think how to improve uh, daily lives of people that live up there. You know, obviously employment and, and good paying jobs and everything is fantastic, but you know, you gotta build up the communities as well. I'm not a professional at that. I'm not sure what stepping stones you do take, but you gotta make it more livable um, in those remote areas as everything kind of grows around it. So whether that's uh, helping build infrastructure, um, we are getting a fiber optic line up to Dees Lake. I don't wanna say that's due to mining, obviously it's, it's needed, but it does help say run an autonomous haul truck from Dees Lake. You can live in, in Dees Lake and then run a truck, say, at a, at a mine site. So um, as far as that perspective goes, it's about also uh, building capacity within the nation so we can grow with the, the industry and, uh, and move into the future with, you know, having more people in manager, management positions, technical positions, things like that. So it's um, also bringing, uh, getting more skin in the game, I think. So having like equity ownership of various things, like Teltan bought 5% of a few run of the river projects. So you do reap some of the rewards on a larger scale than say just employment. So. Yeah. Yeah. I get excited about this question for all the like the tech answers for it. I'm like, oh, like, I saw this solar hydrogen airplane a couple days ago and blew my mind. And th there's so many cool technologies but it comes down to more what Cody's talking about, like having the right business models to make that happen. It's a, your beliefs, like going faster. So it's kind of getting rid of more, I don't think it's a technology answer to the question. It's, even though there's a lot of exciting developments, it's more getting rid of the limiting beliefs that are stopping you from moving faster or trying out new business models. So I think that leads us to the, the next question on pigeonhole that has been uh, just slowly at the top for almost the entire session we've been up here. So uh, where do you really see the growth opportunities in, in each of your industries? And um, we really, we have time for about two more questions. So um, we'll answer this and then we've just got one more after that. Growth opportunities. I mean, I think that the future it is electric and things are starting to go that way with, as you mentioned with, um, well, the climate strikes, you know, youth are mobilizing and they are going to become able to vote soon. So politicians will have to start listening to them. And I mean, with the Clean BC plan, electrification was a big part of that. And that's where, that's where I see it going. Um, it's important to not to be completely technology prescriptive. You know, I, I'm saying wind is the cheapest, but maybe wind's not the best for that site. Um, so there's lots of other technologies that are doing well, there's the solar, the run of river hydro, it really just depends on who is trying to build the project, where they're trying to build it, and you know, the, the way that people balance the grid is becoming a lot more innovative, and there's actually kind of an interesting thing where um, consumers are now becoming pro producers as well, so like there are some people who are doing you know, rooftop solar, and that's kind of been stifled in, in BC, just with the way that our grid's set up, but you know, these are all trends to watch, and, be interesting. Yeah. Any other really exciting growth opportunities you see in the future? I, th I think within the nation itself is, uh, you know, we've done a pretty good job to leverage ourselves um, to take full advantage of, because like I said, our main economic drivers are the mine industry, of the mine industries when they're there as well. It's very cyclical and, uh, and what jobs are one thing that's great on an individual level, but, you know, we've, we've accumulated, say, a, a trust that helps to help us in the long term with education dollars and things like that. So you gotta take full advantage of it when it's there, because um, it may 
at some point, I suppose, dry up. It's cyclical, but we do have some majors in the area that are consistent, but um, it's building the, the education and, uh, and just looking out for the long term. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a, we talk a lot about technology and innovation going forward of being the growth opportunities in the future, but there's an incredible uh, social component mm -hmm. to that as well, that, that really there are many advancements 100%. coming towards us, I think. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so then we'll move to our last question, and uh, it's always fun to tell the audience that there's only one more question, because you see where the votes really want to go, and uh, we had a similar <laughs> question to this as well. So the question given, to the, given from the audience is, do people in the Lower Mainland really understand that their lifestyle in Vancouver is a result of the resource industry? And uh, the way that I had looked at this earlier is, maybe what message do you have for people in the urban communities, and perhaps specifically in Vancouver, given the question, uh, that don't have the same connection and understanding to the resource industry. So I think it's probably fair to say that those of us working in the resource industry in Vancouver understand this, and the vast majority of Vancouverites do not have that connection. So what message do you have for, for those people living primarily in Vancouver, but uh, other southern urban communities? It is, it's, it's a difficult one, as someone in communications, um, and it, it's unfortunate at times. You mentioned like lithium batteries in your cell phone, right? People don't get that. Toilet paper. Guys, what do you think is going to happen, right? Um, <laughs> I know we're talking about hope, but I'm like, even going to Abbotsford to like, where, did, where does your produce come yeah. from? And so, um, so I don't know if I have a single message, but what I do know is we, we have some interesting stats at Kofi. 40% uh, of jobs in the forest sector actually lie in the lower mainland, which is mind-blowing to me because I don't think there's a similar pride in the lower mainland for the resource sector, even though so many people are working, working in it or know someone that's working in it. So I really think it's a sense, rather than a key message, it's, it's a suite of messages, a suite of whatever um, communication products you need to create pride. Uh, it's BC made, it's locally grown, it's renewable, it's green, it's gluten free, it's vegan, whatever you want, whatever label you want to attract people in the lower mainland, but it's about this, it's about pride, Canadian pride, BC pride. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think all of our sectors can work on that a little bit. Yeah, one thing I think too is, uh, you know, we do things pretty well here in Canada compared to some other jurisdictions, and if we don't kind of help fill that market gap, somebody else is going to do it. You know, so we could be a shining example of how to do it properly um, to people. So when you're looking at, like, you know, you're, you're, you're getting heavily re regulated and all these and having these bad misconceptions, you could be like, we could be a shining example of how to do it properly compared to other places because we're going to need the copper either way. We want a, you know, cleaner future. We need copper for all sorts of things. You know, emerging economies want to build houses. Everybody wants electricity, this and that. We're going to have to get it. And whether it's us doing it or someone else, we do it pretty well compared to some other places. So, I mean, that's a, that's a good message to get across as well. Okay, so very quickly then, if there's one statement that you would like to leave the audience with, one key message, what is it today? Not to put you on the spot. We'll go with Fiona. Always fun. Um, my key message is a plug. So I know, I know uh, you, we were asking about the future in 2040. Forestry is um, obviously experiencing significant headwinds currently. Um, and the key message for me is that it, to improve or to get to where we need to be, it's about collaboration and all working together. It's not just industry. It's not just government. It's both of those. It's First Nations. It's academics. It's workers. It's contractors. We need to come together to find the solutions. Uh, last September, Kofi put out our Smart Future, a path forward for BC's forest products sector, uh, where we laid out 60 ideas. They're just ideas. It's not a comprehensive list. It's not all of them. There can be more. There could be less. But just ideas for all of those groups that I mentioned on how we can work together uh, to get to our industry to where it needs to be. Yep. Collaboration. Collaboration. Good one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jessica? Um, I would say... In Prince George, the, the work that we're doing, the impact, it, it's the first time commercially that hydrogen will be offered for a lower price than diesel. And I think we kind of underestimate that's the first time in the world. It's happening right here in Prince George. I think we have so much to be proud of. And that's the result of 
to your point, collaboration between a clean technology company and some traditional sectors like a chemical company, trucking fleets that, you know, innovation isn't the first thing that comes to mind for people when they think of these industries, but here it is, it's happening in Prince George. And then, again, I just think it, there's so much to be proud of in that. Yeah, so pride. Yeah. Really the one word, yeah. Yeah. Cody? Um, we can't forget that all these industries are human resource based. Mm -hmm. We have people that actually have to go onto the ground and make it happen. So when we're doing all the planning and all the, all the various things, we, we can't forget that uh, you know, these are human resource businesses. We have people that actually got to go, like a mining obviously background, uh, blow up the rock, pull it out, do all these things. So how can we support them? How can we help them progress? Because that's how we're going to increase efficiency and, and uh, progress into the future. So sometimes I think we get caught up in the finance and all the different parts about the businesses and forget that uh, all this work and, and everything we put in comes down to somebody literally on the ground making it happen. So mm -hmm. how can we help them, uh, them progress? Yep. And the last message that I'd like to leave everyone with, with, with is, you know, we're trying to reduce our emissions by 40% by 2030, but that goal is even bigger of 80% below 2007 levels by 20, 2050. So in order to accomplish that, we're gonna have to make some really big changes. I saw that there was a question we didn't get to, but it was about, you know, how do we manage emissions of the upstream? And that's gonna be a really big question that the natural resource sector has to answer. And I, I do think that electrification of upstream production is a big part of the puzzle. Uh, the federal government and the provincial government did sign an MOU to work towards that. So I know that we're all trying to work together to meet those goals. And the clean energy industry, you know, it's been around for a while. It's not something that's brand new. There's been projects that have been around for, you know, 100 years, some of them. So it's here to stay, and it's definitely going to be able to deliver the solutions that we need to reach our goals. It's a, it's a big problem, but I think that we can, we can do it. Absolutely. So for a... <laughs> For a panel that started with themes of the future, technology, and climate change, we've ended up with the key values being collaboration, pride, people, and solutions. So with that coming from the next generation and today's current leaders, uh, some good key messages to keep in mind. So with that, I know Sarah wants me to wrap up, so a big, huge thank you to uh, C3 and all the organizations and to all the panelists.